Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Hagen from Progress Coaching, and, and my role's a little bit different. I'm going to be the narrator and the interviewer, and we have a partnership with the Howard Company, today's sponsor. And this is a broadcast, an interview, a series of thought leadership practices between some industry leaders about how we go about getting back to um, a new normal, whatever that's going to be. And what are some current organizations doing strategically um, at their restaurants, um, in terms of what they're doing with their businesses. And so my role is to monitor the Q&A chat, ask some questions, facilitate a conversation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gary Kurtz from the Howard Company, uh, who's today's sponsor. Gary? All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, it's Gary Kurtz, uh, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at the Howard Company. Uh, we wanted to put this on today, uh, not to talk about uh, products and things with the Howard Company, but kind of talk about the industry, uh, get, some, get some insights from people. And, but I am here to an answer questions uh, in particular to the Howard Company uh, and how those things get done as uh, some of our panelists will be talking through things. People might have some particular questions. So I appreciate everybody coming. Uh, hopefully everybody gets something out of this and uh, we are, we're excited to see how many people uh, signed up and are here. So uh, Tim, take it away. So the first person we're going to introduce from the Black Gold Restaurants is Sean Sylvester in about 60 seconds. Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your, your restaurant, and uh, your place in the industry. Hey, yeah, my name is Sean Sylvester, and I'm over the Black Gold Restaurant Group. We're a multi-concept restaurant group. We do, um, we're all the way from pizza, full service, restaurant, bar, and family cooking, dinership, and even in the just started in the hamburger world. So um, do many things there. I'm the CEO of the company. I've got three directors, not, not as big as a lot of the guys on here, but basically focused out of Tulsa and um, a lot of things that have been around for a long time in, in the Oklahoma marketplace. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Scott, introduce yourself and the, uh, uh, your restaurant group. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for being on the call today. Um, Freddy's Frozen Custard started uh, 17 years ago. We have 380 locations in 33 states. I'm the COO and co-founder of the concept. Um, we have steak burgers, frozen custard, uh, and we have drive throughs And in today's world, that's a great thing to have a drive through in today's world. And uh, welcome, everyone, on the call. Dana, tell us a little bit about your restaurant group and yourself. Hi, this is, I'm Dana Abood. I'm with uh, Rigo Restaurant Group. Um, and so that is both Quiznos and Taco Del Mar restaurants. Um, I'm the brand director for the Quiznos brand. Um, we have about 500 locations um, in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and then Taco Del Mar has got about 100 restaurants. So cool. The first question we're going to ask the group is, you know, what's been the toughest thing so far for your organization and what are you doing to overcome it? And that's obviously a loaded question. So Sean, we're gonna start back with you, but what's the toughest thing so far for your organization and what are you doing to overcome it? Well, being um, the toughest thing for me as far as the sit down restaurants is you know not having people come inside and, and sit at the tables. Um, we were prepared as far as we did a lot of catering and we were already pretty ingrained in the third party delivery system. So that's really kind of when I'm talking about the Shiloh's brand and um, we were, our caterings never really stopped. They increased. We, we lowered some package pricing and things like that to do more for the community and things. But um, it really has just been, you know, not having to set down ownership. And I, and I, and I'm on the two sides of the fence. I mean, I've got the pizza industry where I'm, 50 to 60% up in sales. And I got the set down diner where I'm, 70 percent down in sales so it, that that was really the biggest biggest obstacle how to balance it all okay cool dana um i think you know i'm sure we all feel it but i mean this has just been an unprecedented situation for restaurants and overall the whole u.s economy and so i think just learning very quickly um as far as what we need to put in place procedures for our restaurants education elements we need to put out for our franchisees since we're a pretty much 100 percent owned by our franchise group um, our restaurants you know we really need to put together all those different procedures um, and marketing pieces and 
educate our franchise owners on what is happening currently in the U.S. economy and out there um, in the, each one of their dismissed areas um, and tell them how to really react to that. So giving them information as far as how do they need to set up a uh, quick pickup and delivery, you know, what items do they need to remove from their restaurants and how to um, really work with the reduction, the very quick drop off in sales and traffic into their stores. Cool. Cool. Scott? You know, looking at this, the, the changes that have occurred are hand, happening rapidly and understanding where to focus on those changes, what to do and what teams you need to bring together to make good decisions. And the communication component, we're sitting here, uh, we're based in Kansas and we're all over the country, understanding what a county, what a state's going to do and then what a county's going to do that's going to override what a state's going to do and understanding all that information so we can get that to our uh, franchisees and to our corporate locations. We have 30 corporate locations also in four different markets. Um, so the communication has been really the critical thing and everybody really has jumped on board and, and we've formed teams that we never would have formed before that have truly made us better. So the communication component, the toughest thing for us right now as we're shifting to the next phase of this is uh, supply chain, getting enough food to distributors. Um, the manufacturers seem to be doing okay. Beef is gonna be a challenge for a while, but the getting it to the DCs and helping DCs understand truly what our needs are and making sure they're bringing in product to take care of our needs. Cool, you know, I've already had a couple questions. Matt and Jan asked a very similar question and that is, how many of you are doing some curbside and have actually changed some of, you know, the curbside dining and pickup? How many of you done some different things there? Anybody want to speak up and, and share? And so the question is, is how many of you have kind of transitioned to that part of your business, maybe because you've never done it or maybe because you're doing it more aggressively? Well, I'm happy to start. We, so we started with, um, sorry, Dave. Um, we started with uh, delivery first. We saw that as the greatest upside. And we had been testing in 20 of our locations, and I believe now we're in over 300 locations. And our uh, delivery supplier, uh, DoorDash, really came through and helped us get locations opened up, understanding that they're opening up probably 100 times more in a week than they're used to doing, mm. and understanding the challenges and that, that that brings to the table. But um, what we stick with, go for the greatest gain. What's our biggest opportunity? And uh, based on what we think we found out, um, we, we focused on delivery and then we laser focused on making our drive throughs faster and better. Adding another venue to serve food, if it doesn't bring you up a, a three to 5%, isn't necessarily a good move because it slows down your other ones. And we, uh, we opted to go that direction. John? Yeah, I mean, we, we really, up the delivery side of things we we focus on the curbside you know putting new signage out front as well and you know i remember 18 years ago launching curbside at applebee's you know it was <laughs> we refocused on some things we did a long time ago and uh it, it really it really did see an uptick we were we were already a very good partner with easy cater and doordash we you know i had over two years experience with them and that was about 20 percent of our business so we saw that become you know 60 percent of our business and and i don't think that's going to go away anytime soon as we you know launch into this new era anything to add dana yeah, I, th I think the only thing, I mean, we're definitely doing curbside and focused on delivery. It's similar to what Scott spoke to earlier. It really depended on the local municipality as far as what was being restricted, as far as if customers were being allowed to go inside the restaurant or not. Obviously, that's an easier for a thing for us to quickly execute is, um, you know, pick up in store versus adding the extra element of curbside. Um, that is some, but that is something we've added to all of our restaurants also. Okay, cool. So quick question for you, Sean. Clark asked a great question. How have you, what have you done to get that 50 to 60% increase in your pizza sales during the pandemic? What are some specific things you've done? Well, we, I had some pizza restaurants that were buffet driven, um, which we had to shut down all buffets. We really just uh, focused more. We, I went aggressively marketing. Um, I hit mail drops, things like that. 
Um, we did a lot with the community as far as with the first responders and hospitals and stuff, getting out in there, helping, helping others out. And we, and then pizza in general is so easy for families that it, you know, it, it's a natural call ahead and come in. I think there was a lot people really started looking at their budgets and when you can get a large pizza for five ninety nine <laughs> delivered to your house, I mean, people are going to do that. And um, so I think it was, we stayed aggressive on the marketing side of it, really focused on what we could do immediately to make people feel safe when they came into our establishment. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the back end now figuring out how I keep all those sales. Cool. Very cool. So Carrie asked a great question, you know, uh, curious about what you're doing with marketing. What have you found success with? I mean, I've heard signage. I mean, I know in my small community, I see signs everywhere that we never used to see because we're a uh, very sit down type of uh, restaurant community. Um, what are some of the things that you guys are doing in terms of marketing? Um, how are you leveraging signage? How are you driving some of the, the curbside? So Carrie's question is about, you know, what are you doing from a unique marketing strategy standpoint? I want to start with you, Dana. Yeah, I think there's not a single answer to that. Um, you know, we've done a lot of different things. Um, from part, we were able to partner with Coca-Cola and doing banners on outside of our, a lot of our restaurants um, to doing window signs and uh, those type of things. So definitely, I think the signage piece is a big part of it. Um, but we've also really focused on our loyalty marketing um, has been really critical to get the message out. And I see that from most brands out there, you know, continually putting out messaging to their um, loyalty members and that type of thing. Um, but also social marketing uh, been a huge part of what we've been focused on. So when you say social marketing, give us a couple examples because that can be a term that a lot of people put their own interpretation on. What do you mean by social marketing and how you're using it? Um, we've primarily focused a lot on uh, Facebook marketing. So customizing some different creatives for both our local restaurants, our franchise owners to put out onto our local Facebook pages, and also keeping that messaging going on our brand page, as far as, you know, we're open, um, what different situations are per restaurant, as far as if they're allowing in-store pickup or just curbside pickup, um, and really customizing those pieces for those franchise owners. So, but it also okay, included cool. Instagram and Twitter and all the different avenues also. Cool, Scott? You know, so uh, I agree with uh, Dana's comment. There's a lot of different things. Um, loyalty, we doubled our points for a period of time. Uh, billboards, we shifted our messages to make sure our guests knew which components were open. And then uh, social media marketing was critical. So our old social media marketing, you see someone, uh, a mother driving up in a minivan to Freddy's and running inside. Well, that doesn't work. So we redid all of our social media marketing with our uh, marketing firm and geared it more towards dining, taking food home, uh, going through the drive through having a picnic outside, and, and shifted all the photos and messaging to make it more pertinent to what's happening in the world today. And um, uh, it was a quick turnaround, but we hate to give a message that doesn't give people what they can do, and uh, it's worked real well. That's, that's interesting, the pictures of what people are doing with like picnics and stuff, I love that. Sean? Yeah, so we even took um, our, um, all our employees in the office, we said, all right, everybody go eat at Freddy's and take a picture of your family dining at home or your family in the car or whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden our social media had pertinent photos to use two days into this. So the quick response was critical and making sure the message is on point. Love that, great idea, Sean. Yeah, I mean, I'll piggyback on everything Scott and Dana just said, I mean, social media, uh, Facebook in general has, has been a big push. Um, one thing we did too was, uh, you know, we got a lot of windows in restaurants. So we got this great idea that if we could decorate every window, get the employees involved in, in painting on the windows, having fun with it, making it look like there's something going on there. Um, we did that about at every location. Um, I also have a food truck so we took the food truck into different neighborhoods as we've been requested and we've had great turnouts. I mean, I've never sold so many, uh, so much root beer and pie in my life, but going <laughs> into just different neighborhoods and things like that. So we, we did a lot of the on the ground grill stuff as well with the social media, the mail drops, uh, things as to that nature. 
Cool. So Gary, let me bring it back to the Howard Company, the sponsor. I mean, what are some of the things you guys are hearing in terms of signage, how people are using it? What, what are some creative things that you're doing? I love some of the things we've heard with, you know, Instagram, taking pictures, you know, putting it out on the social sites. But in terms of what your business does in terms of signage, what are some of the things you're hearing from your customers and how they're using some of those things to draw attention to their restaurants and organizations? Yeah, so the, the, I think the biggest thing that everybody's kind of touched on is curbside. Uh, whether or not you did curbside at the start of this or not, uh, I think we've, I think the entire country is now uh, like found curbside. So it's gonna be something that might stick around for a little while. That might be a question uh, at the end for these guys to say if they, if they you know, what is gonna stay. Um, the other thing is in, in preparation, we we're seeing a lot of people putting up uh, shields and barriers inside for when they can reopen. Uh, that's that's been been big, and then you know just fine tuning those drive through areas too for the drive through restaurants. Uh, like Scott said, uh, quick turnarounds and being very pointed with your branding so people know exactly what they want. And I think that the other thing that we're going to see a lot of people do that. Uh, isn't as much signage, but, you know, digital technology with the apps and stuff like that is going to be uh, very key uh, coming, coming out. Cool. So, you know, going forward, what are some of your plans that you have in place strategically? You know, we talk a lot about, you know, in different industries, there's really three fundamental choices. We're going to walk out of this. We're going to run out of this. Obviously, we want to sprint out of this crisis, whatever that might mean, because we really don't know where things are going in terms of the crisis and what have you, and certainly the impact in your industry. What are some strategies you're currently putting in place now that you think will position you, maybe even outside of marketing, that will position your organization to kind of, when we get back to whatever that new normal is going to be, where you feel like you've, you're gaining that traction now, what are some things you're doing now that you think are going to position you for later? Sean? Well, you know, I think sanitation is going to be the number one key, and it's going to be one of the things that everyone looks at. I think it's more than ever if you can promote your business on everything you're doing. Um, and, and I'm sure all of us have thought about this. You know, are we going to come back wearing face masks? Are we going to come back with, you know, more, you know, I know one thing we did is we went to a text waiting system in every location. So you don't have to wait in the, the lobby you know, you can go go to your car. We'll text you when it, when it's time for you to sit, come sit down. I know that the capacity, reducing capacity inside of things, and, and I agree with Scott 100% on drive-throughs. Uh, if you didn't have a drive-through before, you, you might rethink that business a little now. I mean, it's <laughs> it's uh, it, it really saved a lot of people. And uh, in, in in the curbside things, and you know, if you have booths, can you get shields between them and things like that? Um, there's going to be a lot of changes. I mean, even to the uh, glove station, you know, how do you put on your gloves in the kitchen? There's, you know, they've got these new automated glove machines that, that blow air into it and you slide your hands in and, and do that. And there's, um, there's a whole bunch of different things that I think we're all talking about regularly. I mean, we we're able to go back in on Friday of this week and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go back in Monday because I've, honestly want to see what everyone else is kind of doing and, and make sure that we're prepared to make everyone safe in the environment, our employees and everyone that comes to eat with us. Scott? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. We've been working on this for a while as franchisor. It's our responsibility. So we have restaurants that last week, we had already set up what we feel is phase one of the reopening stage and had photos and documents out to all our franchisees. And we look, we're looking at this two ways. We know around the country the rules are going to be different. And we all do things a certain way and have a certain pride and passion and culture within our companies. And it's great to know the rules are going to be, they appear to be a little more lenient than expected. But as we open up, we're, we're taking it, we're going to earn the trust of our, continue to earn the trust of our guests and go above and beyond. You mentioned uh, shields between booths. We already have those shipping to every restaurant in the country uh, as a four ship, because that's going to be a standard for Freddy's. Is it going to be for a period of time anyway? Is that going to be mandated in 100% of the counties? No. 50? No. 25? Maybe. But we think when a guest walks in and they see all these items in place that give them more trust in dining out, and Sean's comment on sanitation is critical. The guest wants to feel safe when they walk in the door and they want to feel comfortable, they want to make sure and see all these clues that are telling them 
that your restaurant truly does care about doing things the absolute right way and safe way first, and then the restaurant comes into play. Dana? Um, I think something we talked on a little bit earlier, um, besides drive through, I think the growth of delivery and third party delivery is just going to continue to expand and be just a standard restaurant um, element. So uh, we've really been focused on it for the last two or three years, but I think this time period has really reemphasized the need to focus on that. Um, and really build those partnerships um, and move that move our operations to really help facilitate um, that kind of business. As I think consumers have gotten used to um, ordering via third parties or ordering for delivery, um, and that will continue on for the next um, forever, basically. Um, so I think that is going to be a big part of it. Um, and I think we're also going to be looking at how similar. We'll um, Scott and Sean have talked about as far as how do we implement these safety elements into our designs of our restaurants. So for us, we don't want to become a 7-Eleven with plexiglass shields around the entire uh, service area, but how do we build in those elements that um, allow our consumers to be feel safe um, ordering from us, coming to our restaurant, customizing their sandwiches the way they want them, um, but also walk away feeling very safe and have that trust into our restaurants, um, as Scott and, and Sean have already stated. It's so interesting. Gonna, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. So what we're going to do, looking to vendors like our company and everything else, so, you know, shields and plexiglass and all those different elements, um, how do we build those into our restaurants? And it's interesting you use the term design. I mean, who would have thought we would design safety? in restaurants, because you don't, you know, obviously this has caused us to look at things differently. The, the next question is, a, is kind of a loaded question and, and take your time in answering it, but it's a, it's a really loaded question because I think what people like myself don't understand is how has this impacted you from a, a people standpoint? We know the, the, the fear and the job security and the thing like furloughs, we know that stuff's out there not, not, not minimizing that, but what are some of the things you're going to do um, in terms of engagement strategies, bringing the people back. Because not only do we have to have safety for our customers, but you've, got, you've now got to recruit people back to an industry that's just been really kind of clobbered. What are some of your engagement strategies with current staff? And what are some of your strategies of bringing people back and attracting them back into your industry? Sean? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is making sure that we, we stayed in contact with everyone throughout this whole process. Cause you know, there were people that, you know, they were f afraid to come back. Um, we're still going to see that we have certain employees that don't feel safe that they can come back now. So we keep that door open. Um, and, and we just, there's in our industry, there's a lot of people that have been furloughed and laid off. So there, there are a lot of people that do want to come back. Um, so, we just have to let them know what we're doing. We're having a staff meeting uh, this week. We're trying to wrap up everything on Sunday before we get back ready to open, knowing you know who's going to be there, who can be there, and showing them all the things we're doing to provide safety and, and sanitation inside the restaurant above and beyond what we've done before. And uh, it, you know, I think just keeping that open line of communication through this entire process has helped us you know i'm also opening a new restaurant this month and you know it's a 250 seat uh, bar bar and sports bar which we are having to go down to half capacity and we're just now back in the hiring phase so we're going to open with half the people we normally would and um and just we're trying to show them and give give the confidence to them that you know, we, we don't know what the consumer is going to do when they come back. You know, there's right. going to be people that flood us. There's going to be, there's going to be certain instances where it, people don't come back. So it's kind of the unknown right now. Okay. Scott? Well, we're, we're very fortunate. Our restaurants never close. And we're not in the full service. Full service is a whole different gamut of opportunities and challenges. With our restaurants, as we're gearing back up for dining rooms, really keeping the attitude of first, safety first. Our, our employees, our team members need to understand that because it's real and it's part of our culture and always has been, but we're emphasizing that more than we ever have to make sure people understand it. 
um, shift by shift appreciating employees. We have 30 corporate locations with close to uh, 12 or 1300 team members. And second week into this, we gave everyone additional funds on their paychecks. And no one knew about it. We sent a letter just saying, hey, thank you. And showing that appreciation, I think today is more critical than ever. And we, uh, and we truly do appreciate, we have some of the lowest turnover rates in the industry with management and hourly and, and continuing with that attitude and culture and making sure our decisions are based on that, uh, we think will reap benefits for all of us. It's a, it's a double win. Our, our team members win and we win and it's the way to go. What were some of the impressions of your people when you did that? Because that's a, that's a pretty you know, um, oxymoron thing in this day and age of what's going on. You know what? I was really, uh, Tim, I, it was interesting. I was in a restaurant because one of the local TV stations, we didn't release this to the public at all, but one of our team members sent the uh, letter that my partner and I sent to all the team members, and uh, they wanted it uh, for the, the news that evening and uh, talked to uh, some of our employees in the restaurant and myself. And then as I was leaving, an employee came up, and it was really touching. And one-on-one -on -one just came up and said, hey, this really does make a difference, and thank you. And uh, I was a little choked up, honestly. It's, um, we sometimes take that for granted. Our, our team members are what drive our business, and like most people in our industry, I started in the dish room, and, they did, and we have people that are moving up in our organization, and we have people that started as line cooks that are now franchisees with multi-location multi franchisees. So that attitude is what drove the decision to assist, and it, we think that's the way to run a company. We're a privately held company. My partner and I can make decisions as we wish. That's awesome. That's why I wanted to kind of dig deeper. Dana? You know, I think for us, um, it starts with our relationship with our franchise owners and our, our operations team and education team have done just a job um, continuing the communication with our franchise owners that we're in this together. Um, this has been something that's been very unique uh, for the industry and you know, how do we continue to support them um, in building their teams back up? Because unfortunately, a lot of them did have to uh, furlough their employees or reduce their staff during this time period. Um, so how do they, you know, bring those people back on? Fortunately, you know, I think the government has done a lot of things to help supplement, um, you know, employ anybody that was laid off um, during this time period. That's also going to make it kind of a hurdle, you know, as we come back. As far as bring those, you know, I know I've heard it from a couple of franchise owners, you know, their employees are making more money on government assistance right Ooh. now versus inside the restaurant. So, you know, bringing them back in and understanding um, and give them confidence that, you know, they're a uh, valued team member uh, and bringing them back into the organization. Well, that'll really go to, you know, obviously the in-store leadership and the way they engage and talk to their people, which is really interesting. And that's what I love. And not that, you, again, every organization is different, but that's like with someone like Scott, that person who came up to Scott probably told about 10 people, 20 people during, by the end of that week. And if we can get people talking positively, good things. What are some things you're going to do, everybody, to recruit? I'll come back to you, Sean. What are you going to do to recruit people back to your place if you happen to furlough them or you need more people in your locations? Because it's probably going to become a pretty competitive part of your industry. Not that it wasn't already, but you know, what are some recruiting things you're doing, Sean? Yeah. You know, it, it will be, you know, I think we'll, we've held on to most all of our employees through this whole process. So we're going to open, um, open back up with some of the restaurants that we, you know, we're just curbside and dine in. Okay. But you know, as I'm doing this with this new location, um, there's, I'm using about every, uh, app out there, you know, to, to recruit I'm using radio. I'm using, uh, billboards. I'm using, you know, going out to places, pick, talking to people, um, and everything, you know, zip recruiter, zippy app, indeed, all of those, all of those things. I'm having to spend a lot more to try to get the foot traffic back in to do that. And, you know, it's word of mouth. You hire you hire good people, and you, you give a give them an opportunity, and and you know we'll we'll enlist a incentive program to where you know bring it bring us people to us. We'll we'll give you so much money to help recruit. Um, it's it's been a little different with opening a restaurant in in this time. Sure. 
Scott? Well, you know, we, we are not as aggressive recruiting right now because we still have most of our employees. We did open two new locations in this window of, uh, of no dining rooms open. And we let our, we like to make our, let our franchisees make those type of decisions. And it was really quite interesting. We opened drive through only with delivery and sales numbers were absolutely surprising to us that that worked. Um, and now we're in the mode of getting ready to open the dining rooms, but um, we're not in an aggressive mode for hiring because most of our team members had the opportunity to stay on a lot different than a uh, full service restaurant. Cool. Dana. I think they did a great job of covering most of the key aspects. Um, I think, you know, we'll continue to focus on social and word of mouth um, from our employees that are, are within our organization. That's usually how we find the best referrals um, and get the best employees in. Cool. So this is kind of a combination. Matt and uh, Jan from Rhode Island asked an interesting question. Do you see curbside as a new industry, a new part of your strategy? Has that changed the way you're looking at things as we go back to whatever the new normal is? And how are you going to uh, approach opening up your dining room? What does that hybrid look like? Sean? Well, you know, curbside's been around a long time. I mean, it's something that we've we've done and, and it, and, you know, at times in certain markets, it, it might make up three to 5% of your business. Um, now it has definitely increased. Um, so I, I do think it will be something we continue to, to, to roll out and, and go in there. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, the, those parking spaces, that practice, the call when you get here, text, text type programs will definitely be introduced into every concept I do again, going forward and stuff. And as far as opening the dining rooms, it's, uh, making sure that we've got the, the proper social distance practices, um, which we have no idea what that looks like yet until right. we get the dining rooms open. So, but I, I think we've all, all like went in there and, and figured out what we think is going to work. And then we'll find that out as, as certain restaurants open, you know, I'm interested. I've got a friend in Atlanta and, you know, I'm talking to him daily of what he's seeing because they actually opened up kind of first in the country. And then, and so, you know, we're going to adapt and, and learn from our peers. And I mean, that's how we're going to do it. Cool. Scott. Cool. Well, I think the um, uh, Sean's comment on learning from peers, I'm very um, fortunate. I sit on the board of the National Restaurant Association and they've given a lot of guidelines. So anybody who hasn't utilized uh, restaurant.org to help get information, they've done an amazing job uh, through this crisis. Um, one advantage I have is networking and I'm involved in some full service restaurants on a small scale. And if you can fit curbside into it, it is going to be part of the new norm. A lot of people are defining this as uh, trying to build an airplane as you're flying it. <laughs> and I, I agree with that uh, uh, scenario. Um, but understanding that today is a consumer in the next six months, forget about what the rules and regs are by county or by state. What is a consumer going to be comfortable with? What is our guest going to be comfortable with in a dining room? Uh, full service restaurants, if it's well spaced, they're going to go in there. If you have booth dividers, whether they're required or not, they're going to feel comfortable dining in your restaurant. If you're in a situation where you're trying to minimalize it and take the attitude that we're going to do the minimum we can do, they're going to come anyway. They're tired of being at home. I think that long term, you're not going to win um, like people with a longer term attitude that understanding that our guests are going to be different. Their behaviors are going to be different. Their buying patterns are going to be different. And we need to be there for them with all the rights, with all the responsibilities of a business owner to do it the right way. Love that. Dana? Yeah, I think for us, curbside wasn't really something that um, maybe we had a couple of locations that did it. Um, so really, we've been rolling, we've rolled out that program to all of our restaurants, um, but we'll continue to have to work through that and adjust um, to make it fit and work within our POS systems, our online ordering system, um, so that we can do that and execute that very fluently. Because uh, right now, we don't have any focus of in restaurant seating and the dining. And so we can focus on bringing meals out to customers um, at their cars and that type of thing. But as our restaurants become busier um, and where our focus becomes more on in restaurant eating um, and seating, 
we've really got to still work through the execution of curbside pickup too. So, Interesting, because I, I had a conversation with a restaurant owner here in Wisconsin where, where I'm located, and the owner, who I know pretty well, had a huge catering business, and he said, it's been almost overwhelming how many people have actually sent him a text because they started the text service, come to the curbside. Mm -hmm. How much, please continue this. I love the convenience, which is interesting because we have a lot of families. So I love what all of you said is those behaviors are changing. So kind of coming back to you, Gary, I mean, what are some of the things that you're hearing from what people are doing with curbside and their strategy and dining and obviously with all the work that the Howard company does, what are some of the other things that you're hearing from people in the industry? So I, I think one of the biggest challenges is that is is customers knowing that people are doing curbside uh is that is that signage out there how do you permanently do it to permanently let people know uh i think the one of the the creative ways that that people need to look at this in, in the restaurant industry is all of our our we're creatures of habit so our habits have gotten broken by this and we're going to have the opportunity to either bring them back into our fold, but we're also gonna have the opportunity to bring them out of, out of their normal tendencies too, with what we look at and how we market to people and letting them know. Uh, there's gonna be a certain part of the, of the population that said, you know what, I didn't really like curbside service, I'm gonna do that. The people that weren't coming into your restaurant was like, oh, but I like this food now. You know, cause they've been trying different things and seeing the different marketing out there. So. Uh, I think that that's going to be important is, is just letting people know all of the different ways that they can be a customer for the, your restaurant is, is going to be very important. So last question, but before we go into some summaries, um, I didn't think about asking this, but I love the conversation we just had about consumer, what they're going to be comfortable with, what's the new behaviors. Are any of you doing any surveying? any data collection, any data analytics in terms of finding out what they're going to be comfortable with? Because my wife is a physician and I was shocked the other day. She said, well, I don't know if I wanna go sit in a crowded restaurant. And I was really surprised by that, but it's interesting because that's part of what, like Gary, you just alluded to, the new behavior change. Sean, are you guys doing anything in terms of doing some survey or data collection of customers? Really mainly just off of social media and, and some questions and throwouts there, but, um, and then a lot of, you know, just peer to peer talk has really been all, all we've been focused on. Okay. Scott. Uh, same thing. I mean, we, we don't really know yet. We're making a lot of assumptions and making decisions based on what we feel are going to be the new uh, best practices and um, utilizing that we think the comfort level is definitely going to change. We know things are going to change. And, you know, one thing I think that's very important for everyone listening is that just because you can do something doesn't mean you need to do it. Does mm -hmm. curbside make sense for you? Are you doing other things that would, if you open up curbside, is it gonna mess up your dining room right away because you're short staffed? Don't feel you need to do everything right away. Take a gradual approach and make sure what you do, you do the right way. And don't feel you need to rush to do everything because everyone else is doing it. Great point. Dana? Yeah, we haven't done anything uh, systematically yet as far as data collection. I think all of us within the uh, support center have been uh, participating in a lot of these type of forums and taking as, as much information as we can take. Because um, I don't even think the consumer yet knows what their thought process and, and feelings are going to be towards eating in restaurants and dining out and curbside pickup and all these things. I think we've really got to kind of continue to be flexible um as we come out of this to adjust to the industry change as it changes um so i think similar to what uh, sean and scott said you know really can just adjust as things uh, kind of come out of this okay cool so last uh, question for all of you is if you could give one bit of advice to other restaurants that may not be thinking potentially as strategically or progressively as you and obviously there's been a lot of good insight um, we've had a discussion from a wide perspective. What's, what's one big major piece of advice you would give to a restaurant owner that might be potentially struggling during this time? Sean? Well, I, I would say, you know, utilize your resources, you know, talk to, you know, talk to your community. Um, I think we've come together as, you know, as restaurants, as collective, there's been a lot of sharing of knowledge and stuff. I think it's shown that, you know, we all support each other. 
and come and coming back in this and then you know it's safety and sanitation i mean it's number one don't don't be afraid to go above and beyond everything you hear uh, put put all the practices in place and and we'll we'll adapt as we go just like scott said earlier just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to i mean let's let's be very cautious in in the way we do this and and err on the side of more than less scott well you know we all learn from our other restaurant tours in the world we all started doing one thing and have shifted and all of our concepts we work for nobody came up with an original idea that said I'm going to do a restaurant and everything I do is going to be new. So the networking component is absolutely critical. You need to understand other restaurants in your segment, what they're doing. People sh readily share information and all work together to get a better outcome for our industry. I think that's critical. Um, and it truly does work. I've talked to people all over the country in different concepts similar. We continually do this. And during this crisis, we've done it more. So as the changes are going to be occurring rapidly, take your time with the changes and make sure you're talking to other people and understand if you truly feel it's going to work or not work. Love that. Dana? The only thing I would else that I added is uh, we've seen just some really great outreach from our franchise owners to within the community, to the local police departments, to local hospitals, um, and to the local community as a whole. So. I think just continuing those relationships um, really kind of help um, found those restaurants within that community. So I think that really helped continue to build those relationships and drive that traffic. Cool. So what I want to do is, you know, obviously, Sean, uh, Scott, Dana, thank you so much for doing this today. And we're going to get the recording out to everybody as the sponsor of this session. Uh, Gary, last comments, thoughts to share with everybody? Uh, I, I just think that, that it's uh, in, incredible because we are going to see everybody kind of bounce back and seeing how different people do things in different parts of the country uh, through different brands uh, is great for insight. The participation, uh, even in the questions and everything, uh, was fantastic. Uh, I'm sure we could do this for hours, but uh, I, I really do appreciate everybody coming uh, because as we know, you know, we're all going to get lifted from this. Uh, so if we can all take a little bit of information from it, uh, we're all going to be better, including, uh, you know, vendors and manufacturers like the Howard Company. So uh, I just want to say thank you. You know, and I'll, I'll just kind of finish with a quick uh, story. We have a local restaurant here in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, where um, a lot of my players, I, I coach high school volleyball, work for this guy, and we kind of put his catering on the map. And uh, my wife and I went in and had dinner one night and, you know, left a pretty sizable tip. And about two weeks later, comes out and brings me my food. And I walked away from my car and I followed him in. I said, what are you doing? I said, I didn't pay. I said, I, I didn't put it on a credit card. He goes, no, lunch is on me. And I posted that on Facebook. And so many people have rallied around this guy. And I love what you shared. I think it was you, Sean, that community. We have to invest in restaurants and go above and beyond the call because it's an industry people like me don't understand. And when he did that, as much as you said, Scott, I got choked up. He employs all my players and he's buying me lunch during this time. And I'm like, who does that? And I have shared that story 20 times in our local Facebook pages and people are putting no surprise, great guy. We're going to use him for catering. I mean, and I think is, as consumers, we also have to remember if we're in the restaurant industry, we're also consumers and we need to give back. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. As attendees, appreciate it. There are a lot of great questions. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, Jan, Matt, all the people asked questions. We will get you the recording out. It will be in a link format. Uh, today's sponsor, the Howard Company, will have it hosted on their website as a video, as well as our uh, panelists today. So thanks to everybody. Great job. Great discussion. And we will continue to do this. Uh, the Howard Company will be doing this on a frequent basis. So again, everybody have a great week and appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great one. Thanks.